Hello, hello, welcome back. Here we are with another home edition, Sunday night version of uh, Math 238, 2020. It's COVID. What else would we expect? Here we are, more eigenvalue and eigenvector results. So here's just a reminder, right? We have an n by n matrix A, an n by one column vector of unknowns, X, and we have lambda, a scalar, which can be a complex number or a real number, right? What is the definition of an eigenvalue, eigenvector pair for a matrix A? It is n by n squared. Um, it is a scalar and a vector that satisfies the equation ax equals lambda x, right? So the action of the matrix where this matrix transforms this vector, right? This matrix transforms this vector into some other vector in uh, Rn, and for what vectors is the action of that matrix transformation the same as just multiplying that vector by a scalar? For what vectors and what special scalars? Those guys, those special vectors and special scalars are our eigenvalue, 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 eigenvector pairs, right? We find our eigenvalues through this equation. We determine where that guy came from. We find our eigenvectors through this equation. We determine where that guy came from, both coming from that one. Here, this zero is an n by one column vector, and this zero is the real number, okay? All right, so here's a little um, just exciting fun, you know, see if you can come up with the, uh, what fill in the blanks here. The eigenvalues of a diagonal matrix or a triangular matrix are what? Let's think, right? If I'm going to do, what is the determinant of a diagonal matrix or a triangular matrix? Yeah, the determinant is the product of the diagonals, right? For a diagonal matrix or a triangular matrix, right? Yeah, we showed that already. Okay, so if the determinant, if I have a diagonal or a triangular matrix and then I subtract lambda off the diagonal and then I take the determinant, then all I'm going to have is just a bunch of factors, right? Of a component of that matrix, which is on the diagonal, minus lambda in each term, right? So what am I going to have? A product of a bunch of factors, yeah? The diagonal element minus lambda equals zero. Therefore, what is lambda going to be? the diagonal elements of each of these matrices, right? So the eigenvalues of a diagonal or triangular matrix are its diagonal elements. Try it for a specific one, okay? That's awesome. So that makes it super easy to talk about the eigen when I have a diagonal matrix or when I have either an upper triangular or a lower triangular matrix, right? That's what we mean by triangular, upper or lower, right? If an upper triangular matrix, so I want to know what the eigenvalues of that matrix are, then all I have to do is read the, read the eigenvalues right off the um, diagonal. Yeah, okay, beautiful. All right, um, let's go on to our next one. A is not invertible if and only if, what is an eigenvalue of A? Maybe what we just talked about just above helps you figure that guy out, right? Um, in a simple case, if we had a diagonal matrix, right? We already know A is not invertible. Yeah, yeah, this is how we're gonna prove it, right? If the determinant of A is zero, and if we have a diagonal matrix, and we have a zero on the diagonal, and one of the zeros is an eigenvalue, then that's going to be a product that's going to cause the entire determinant to be zero. Yes? So there we go. Um, let's prove this, okay? It's an if and only if statement, right? So it goes both directions, right? So let's prove this direction first, right? If A is not invertible, which is the same as A inverse does not exist, right? If A inverse does not exist, then we're going to show so we're going to um, prove first, if A inverse doesn't exist, then lambda equals zero is an eigenvalue of A, okay? So what do we know? The proof of this piece, right? Um, let A inverse not exist. <laughs> 
i.e. that's the same as a is not invertible. Well, what do we know if a is not invertible? So the determinant of a, good, must be zero, right? That's what it means, right? But last time we showed that those two things were um, equivalent. A is not invertible, determinant of A must be zero. But if the determinant of A is zero, right, the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of A minus zero I, right? We're here, this is the zero scalar, yeah? Or that's a lambda, right? So that also is equal to zero because the determinant of A is zero, right? And this guy says that lambda equals zero is an eigenvalue. <laughs> right? Because that's the definition of being an eigenvalue. So that was pretty quick and easy to go that direction. The other direction is very similar. All right, if we're going to do if lambda equals zero is an eigenvalue of A, then A is not invertible. To show that direction now we're going to prove that so let's start with what comes after the if right let lambda be equal to z let lambda equal zero be an eigenvalue of a what does that mean so the determinant of a minus lambda i is equal to zero when lambda is equal to zero right well if i put that in there whoop right there right therefore the determinant of a minus zero times i, the identity matrix, is equal to zero. But the scalar zero times the identity matrix is just the zero matrix, right? So that's the determinant of a minus the zero matrix a, right? The zero, the n by n zero matrix, right? Um, is equal to zero, but a minus the n, one, n by n zero matrix is just the determinant of a. So there we are again. Yes, that zero is a zero, n by n zero matrix, that zero is a zero scalar, yes? All right, awesome, that zero is a zero scalar, yeah? That i is the n by n uh, identity. Okay, so, um, so there we have another nice characterization of invertibility, okay? If I have a zero eigenvalue, a is not invertible, and vice versa, right? Um, so the same idea with our contrapositive, right, would say, then, I don't think that works real well. I can try it. That if, uh, oh, it doesn't work too bad. Okay, that if um, lambda equals zero is not an eigenvalue of A, then A is invertible, right? Okay. So that's another nice way of characterizing invertibility and relating to eigenvalues, yeah? Okay, so are you ready? Ready for more? Here we go, woo -hoo, lots of fun, right? Just like you never know what's around the next corner or the rest, next turn. Here's the next one. A and A transpose have the same eigenvalues. How awesome is that, right? Well, let's look at this. How would we show that, right? Well, eigenvalues come from this second of these equations, right? The determinant of a minus lambda i equals zero gives us our eigenvalues. So let's look at that expression, right? A minus lambda i. Let's think about that expression. And um, let's think about the transpose of that expression, okay? So what is the transpose of that? Well, a minus lambda i transpose, we know that the transpose is a linear operation, right? So that's a transpose um, minus lambda i transpose, yeah? Lambda is just a scalar multiple of i, so we know we can pull that lambda out, right? In the minus is an algebraic operation, right? Arithmetic, so we know we could do that too. And tell me, what is i transpose? Good. I transpose is just I, right? Why? Because I is a symmetric matrix. Right? I is symmetric, so it transposes itself. Yes? Good. So A minus lambda I transpose is equal to A transpose minus lambda I. Why is that useful to us? Okay? Whoa, right 
can live with myself. All right, um, so let's recall, right, that the determinant of a matrix, say a minus lambda i, yeah, the determinant of a minus lambda i, which determines the eigenvalues of a, right? That determines the eigenvalues of a, okay? That that's equal to the determinant of the transpose of that matrix, right? Whoops. Yeah? Didn't leave myself too much room there. That the determinant of one matrix is equal to the determinant of its transpose, right? That was back from our definition of how to compute a determinant. We could, we, we could expand about a row, we could expand about a column, yeah? So the determinant of this is equal to the determinant of that, but we just showed that that matrix, A minus lambda I transpose, is the same as, A minus lambda I transpose is the same as A transpose minus lambda I. But what does this equation define? This equation defines the eigenvalues of A transpose. Right, because it's the determinant of thing minus lambda i. The determinant of thing minus lambda i equals zero tells me the eigenvalues of that thing, right? And so, oh, sorry, the eigenvalues of a are determined by that is equal to zero, right? And so since that equals zero equals that, which equals that, then the eigenvalues of a transpose are equivalent to the eigenvalues of a. Beautiful, right? How super simple and nice use of the algebraic properties and um, the various properties of the um, uh, various things related to matrices. That's super awesome, right? Determinant, transpose, symmetric matrices. So, so nice. Okay, um, let's look at the next one. Okay, if lambda and x, right? We're going like crazy wildfire here, right? This is beautiful though, right? It's so much faster than actually computing eigenvalues and eigenvectors of matrices, right? It doesn't get any better than this. All right, if lambda and x are an eigenvector, eigenvalue, <laughs> eigenvalue, eigenvector pair, right? Eigenvalue, eigenvalue, eigenvector pair. Lambda is the eigenvalue and x is the eigenvector, right? Your book uses v, right? We can use any, lots of, you know, lots of books do lambda v, we could say, or lambda x. It doesn't matter what letter you use, right? All those x's can be v's, okay? Um, but if lambda and x are an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for A, and A inverse exists, then, okay, here's, this is our fourth result, then what is an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for A inverse? I don't know, do you know? Do you know? I don't know. Well, you know, that's our question. What, what? Okay, we don't know. Let's just see what happens if we can figure it out, okay? So if we start with the fact that lambda and x are an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for A, right? Then it means all three of those equations hold. So the question is, which one do we use, right? So depending when we're doing these, these uh, uh, types of proofs of results related to eigenvalues and eigenvectors, it's just a question of which one of those three guys gives you the best way to get at the result. Up here and the previous ones, we used the, the determinant expression because that um, related directly to the eigenvalues only, and it um, just had the simplest manipulations to allow us to get there, okay? All right, so right here we're talking about eigenvalue eigenvector pair, and so that's probably like, oh, maybe this one, right, okay? Because um, it's simpler than this one and they're the same, right? Okay, all right, so, if I know lambda and x are an eigenvalue eigenvector, eigenvector pair for A, then I know AX equals lambda x, right? Right? Therefore, I know that. If I know A inverse exists, right? So since A inverse exists, I can apply A inverse to both sides. Yeah? Oops, I gotta actually do that, right? Okay? Now, why did I apply A inverse to both sides? It's because I want to use the beautiful property that I can rewrite this. What's that called? So I should have law good for matrices um, like that on that side. On this side, what do I, was it the associative law? Is that what I'd be doing? Would I be writing A inverse times lambda? 
Yeah, no, you can see by the look on my face. No, 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 right? Lambda is a what? A scalar, right? And what did we show? A matrix times a scalar times a vector is the same as the scalar times the matrix times the vector, right? That was one of our properties of matrices. Yes? Awesome. Okay, so two very different things, right? Associative law for matrices over here, the scalar multiple idea over there. So what is A inverse A? Yay, I. Good, so I got Ix on this side, okay? And then what do I have on this side? Lambda times A inverse X, yeah? Well, Ix is just X, right? Okay? That's the beauty of the identity matrix. Whatever you multiply gives you back the same thing. And so wait, hold, him, hold on a minute here, right? Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it, right? How cool is this? What do we need? If we're trying to determine what an eigenvalue, an eigenvector pair for A inverse is, that's what we're doing right now, is we're trying to determine an eigenvalue, eigenvector pair for A inverse, yeah? Then we need an equation that says A inverse times some vector is equal to some constant times, an in, time, times that same vector, right? Are we super close? Do we have A inverse times some vector? But we have this constant out in front, we want to get rid of it, so what should we do? Yeah, divide by lambda, right? Okay, so now what do we do? 1 over lambda x is equal to A inverse x, yes? Right? And is that not just this exact same equation, just written the other way? Yeah? So what do we know? We know that A inverse x is 1 over lambda x, yeah? And that says what? That equation right there tells us precisely what we were looking for. If lambda and x are an eigenvalue pair for A, and A inverse exists, by this application of matrix algebra, what does this tell me? That 1 over lambda, and what? The exact same eigenvector x. Right? It's the exact same guy. How phenomenal is that? Right? Then 1 over lambda and x are an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for A inverse. Now, that is awesome because we all know how hard it is to compute A inverse, right? That's a mess. And then think about computing like the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for A inverse. But you don't have to. If you know them for A, then the eigenvalues are just 1 over. And the eigenvectors are precisely the exact same thing. That is crazy, right? That's so cool. That is worth Sunday night math. Yes. Okay. Um, that is awesome. So awesome. And once again, you kind of see this connection between the idea that lambda can't be zero if A inverse is going to exist, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? And vice versa. Okay. So super cool, right? So super cool. All right. I'm going to erase this one. And um, now we're going to adapt the next one to even more. So if lambda and x are an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for A, now we're going to do a new result. And then What is the eigenvalue eigenvector pair for A squared? Yeah? Is the computation a whole lot different than what we did here? Right? We would do pretty much the exact same thing, yeah? We would start with we know that lambda and x are an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for A. So AX equals lambda x, right? Well, now we want to create A squared, right? So instead of multiplying both sides, by A inverse, we would multiply both sides by A. Yeah? So then here we would have, use the um, associative property to write this as A times A, and here we would use our scalar property to pull that lambda out and we'd have lambda times AX, right? So then what would we have, right? We would have A times A is a squared, yeah, okay, 
And then we've got over here, so let's just erase the rest of this now, we'll see if you, and we've got over here, um, lambda times a x, right? And our goal is, we wanna know, we wanna know what the eigenvalues of a squared are, right? So what do I need? I need a squared x equals constant times x, right? And I've already got a squared x right here, and I've got equals constant but times ax, so that's a problem, right? But what is ax equal to? Yeah, yeah, right? From a, ax is the same as lambda x, right? Because the action of the matrix A on x for this eigenvector is the same. It transforms it into just simply something that scalar multiplies it, right? And so ax is lambda x, so what do I get? Lambda times lambda x, yes? But lambda times lambda is lambda squared, and so what do we get? a squared x is lambda squared x. And therefore, what did we just now discover? If lambda x are an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for a, then what's an eigenvalue? If lambda is an eigenvalue for a, what's an eigenvalue for a squared? Lambda squared, how crazy is that? What is the corresponding eigenvector for that lambda squared? What? It's just the same guy, x. That's nutty, right? Yeah? And what do you think is gonna happen if we change it to a cubed? Yeah? Right? Then we could multiply by a squared here on both sides, right? Then we would have a cubed, yeah? And then we would have lambda a squared x, but that would be lambda times a times ax, right? Here's a cubed, right? But this would be lambda times a, what's ax? Oh, lambda x, right? That lambda comes out, so that becomes lambda squared ax, but what's ax? Oh, lambda x, so that's lambda cubed x, right? Okay, and therefore, what do we got? What's the only thing that changes? Eigenvalue, if I know an eigenvalue for A, then eigenvalue for A cubed is the cube of the eigenvalue for A. The eigenvector is the exact same eigenvector that went with the eigenvalue with A. Nothing changes. How much easier is that than actually trying to compute those eigenvectors, right? The eigenvectors take a while to compute, right? So what's the final deal? What if I raise this to any particular power k, right? Um, and k is a positive constant, right? Then there we go. Alrighty. Lots of fun with eigenvalues and eigenvectors where you don't, you can save yourself tons of time by understanding the theory, understanding the matrix algebra, and utilizing the result. There's plenty other interesting results as well um, for you to discover, right? So if you end up with a question on your homework that we haven't covered yet, try to discover your own theorem, yeah, related to those eigenvalues and eigenvector pairs um, or vice versa. Okay, so let's see, what else should we do next? Let's um, make one more definition, okay? So let's define something else. Ready? Here we go. I know you're blown away by all the fun with eigenvalues and eigenvectors and crazy blow your mind. Easy ways to compute um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of matrices related to A. Um, okay, so um, let's let A, B, and P all be n by n matrices, okay? Um, they can be matrices with real or complex um, values, okay? Um, then we say, there's a new vocab word, okay? 
we say that B is similar to A, B is similar to A if, you're used to this letter, right? There exists an invertible matrix P, okay, such that if I take the inverse of P, multiply on the left times A, and then multiply the P on the right of A, if that produces B. B and A are similar matrices if they're related by some matrix P and its inverse in this product. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, now obviously, right, um, if I apply P to the left side of both of those matrices, right, I will get PB is equal to AP, and then I apply P inverse to the right, I will get PB, P inverse is A, yeah? Okay, and so if A is if B is similar to A, A is similar to B because these guys are this is the inverse of that guy, right? This has to be that this is the inverse of that guy, and vice versa. So that's a nice little idea. Why do we care? The two matrices are similar if they're related in that way for some magic invertible matrix P. Okay. Um, here's another new term. A, um, an n by n matrix A is called diagonalizable. Diagonalizable, this is a big long word, is diagonalizable if and only if. Okay, here's the definition. It is similar, so, right, so it just makes it easier to write. We define the other words so that we can just make this one easier. It's similar to a, what do you think? What kind of matrix? Diagonalizable? Good. A diagonal matrix. Okay? A is diagonalizable if it's similar to a diagonal matrix. Okay? So, um, if, right, there exists P such that an invertible matrix P such that the, when I do P inverse times A times P, so A here could be like a full matrix, right? And then there's this magic matrix, magic matrix P, right? That I multiply P inverse on the left of A and P on the right of A, and I change it into a diagonal matrix. And we love diagonal matrices, right? They're so much easier, yeah? Okay, so that's pretty awesome, right? Um, Pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Okay, so you might imagine that it's not always possible to do this for any matrix A, right? That would be like a pipe dream to be able to turn any matrix A to make it similar to a diagonal matrix. And so we want to know when can we do that, okay? When can we do that? That's our next question. This video is going to end very soon. Don't worry. Oh, but I have to erase this part, so hold on. Okay, so when is this possible? It's your theorem. Basically, all the results we did earlier were also theorems. Um, but an n by n matrix A is diagonalizable, and we have a definition for it now. It has to be able to be similar to a diagonal matrix. We know what similar means. Um, it's diagonalizable. Theorem helps you just classify, right, this instead of having to always go to the definition. Um, we're not going to prove this theorem, so rest easy. Um, if and only if um, the, here they are, right, eigenvectors, whoo, right, okay. Um, um, 
eigenvectors of A. You should have seen that coming, right? You should have seen that coming. Yes, good. Um, if the eigenvectors of A form a basis for Rn, okay? Um, okay, so then what do we know? Um, well, we know the dimension of Rn, okay? This, we're going to really, what is the dimension of Rn? Good, n. How many basis vectors does it take, right, to, um, to produce a basis for Rn? n, right? What's the, what's the basis for R2? 1, 0, 0, 1, standard basis, right? Two vectors, right? We've done that so long ago, we may forget, right? Um, dimension of R3 is 3, right? What is the... Standard basis for R3, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? Okay, three vectors. All right, so um, what do we know, right? So if we, if the, eigen, the eigenvectors of A then have to form a basis for Rn, um, we need N vectors to form a basis for Rn. So what, we're going to skip a whole, whole, whole bunch of stuff. Um, so... So what do we need? We need n linearly independent vectors, right, to come from the eigenvectors of A. And um, essentially, if we have distinct eigenvalues, then the eigenvectors associated with distinct eigenvalues um, are linearly independent. So if you have all distinct eigenvalues, like our very first example for our um, matrix A, then the bases for the eigenspaces for those eigenvalues form a basis for Rn, okay? And it might, it's not going to be the standard basis, right? And you think about the basis that we had for our very first example, right? So there's lots of different bases for Rn, but for R3, for example, it was a three by three matrix, um, but the standard basis is the one everybody loves, but any three linearly independent vectors that live in R3 is also a basis for Rn. Okay, um, so now what? Um, the beauty of knowing the dimension of the space, right? Uh, our definition of basis, we have a linearly independent spanning, linearly independent spanning set. You gotta be a set of vectors that's linearly independent and span the space. If you know the dimensions of the space, then linear independence, uh, and you know linear independence, you get span for free. If you know the dimension of the space, and you know they span, then you get linear independence for free. So it, they're one in the same if we know the dimension. Okay, um, back to what we were saying. So if we have distinct eigenvalues, they correspond to distinct eigenspaces, and those bases for those eigenspaces spaces will form a basis for our end. But what if we have a repeated eigenvalue? And then the question just becomes, well, how many basis vectors do we get for their eigenspaces? And so, here is the quick and dirty version of this. Um, uh, therefore, um, of this result, just because we're out of time in this crazy COVID semester. Um, therefore, A is diagonalizable. A is diagonalizable if and only if what? Um, so the dimension of the eigenspace associated with, um, say, our first eigenvalue, lambda 1, okay, plus the dimension of the eigenspace associated with the second eigenvalue um, for A, plus the dimension of the eigenspace associated with the case eigenvalue. The dis so we have k distinct eigenvalues, right? Um, k distinct eigenvalues. k is going to be less than or equal to m, right? Okay. So if k equals n, then we're golden. But if k is less than n, then that means we have some repeated eigenvalues. And therefore, uh, you have to count the number of basis vectors that you get for those eigenspaces. And if you get n, then A is diagonalizable, okay? Um, so right, these are just, what is this? This is the number of basis vectors 
for the Ivan space associated with um, the first distinct eigenvalue, the next distinct one, the next distinct one. You just count them all up, right? Um, and if we get n, we're golden, okay? Let's close with this final idea. Where does P come from? Okay. Then, right, in that case, right, we'll have A is diagonalizable. And so we have D is P inverse AP, right? What is D? D is the diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues on the diagonal, right? Diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues on the diagonal. And what is P? P is the, uh, a matrix whose columns are ordered eigenvectors. Columns, uh, columns are ordered eigenvectors. So let's let's just do a quick example of what we mean. Back to a problem we already did about how we would compute D. So there's various choices for D, and there's various choices for P, right? For any one A, especially, well, well, because we can order the eigenvalues any way we want, right? In D. Okay, so if we go back to um, recall, where's our matrix, sorry. Um, yes, okay, recall our matrix. This was our first example, I believe. One of our, no, it wasn't. It was one of our examples. <laughs> recall our matrix A, which was 2, negative 1, 3, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1. That was one of the examples we did um, the last time. And we found that a, um, we found that lambda was equal to negative 1 and 2, right? So we only had two eigenvalues. And, and this guy is 3 by 3, right? So what is n? n is 3, yeah? So here k is two, we have two distinct eigenvalues. This guy was a double, right? He was a repeated root. So K is two and that's less than three, which is N. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so um, what was a basis for the eigenspace associated with the eigenvalue two? It was one, zero, zero. And a basis for the eigenspace about, um, associated with um, negative one was we have lots of different options. Um, we'll just go with um, one, three, zero, and negative one, zero, one, okay? We had the one with the one third, one, zero, right? Okay, so how many basis vectors do I have? Here I've got two, so the dimension of this eigenspace is, or sorry, here I've got one, the dimension of that eigenspace is one. Here I've got two basis vectors, so the dimension of that eigenspace is two, right? And so the dimension of E2 plus the dimension of E negative one is one plus two, which equals three, which equals our N, right? And therefore this A is diagonalizable. Yeah? Yay! Okay, so now how could we create this expression? We have lots of options, right? So D, right, D, we just have to put the eigenvalues along the diagonal. It doesn't matter, right, which one we put where. We know that the off-diagonal elements are gonna be zeros, right? Um, 
And then we just have to put negative one, two negative ones and a two. And we can say negative one, negative one, two, or we can say negative one, two, negative one, or we can say two, negative one, negative one. It just doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter what we do. So if we say two, negative one, negative one, and actually I'm not gonna even do that because I don't want you to think I have to, it has to be in like that order. I'm just gonna like say, okay, I'm gonna do negative one, two, negative one, just for fun, okay? Doesn't matter, okay? So if I order them that way, then that determines for me my, my P, right? My P has to be columns that are the ordered eigenvectors, uh, basis vectors associated with, um, with the eigenspaces. So in this column, I have to pick one of my two eigenvector bases associated with um, ordered bases or eigenspaces, really, okay? Um, I'm gonna have to make that because I can't not. Okay, so I've got my eigenvalue of negative one here, so I got to pick one of these two. It doesn't matter which one I pick, right? But that one of those two has to be in this first column. So we'll just say one, three, zero, okay? Now I put zero, two, zero, two, two is in my second column for my diagonal. So that means that P has to be one, zero, zero, okay? Because that's the eigen basis for the eigenspace associated with that eigenvalue. And then the only remaining one is the one we haven't picked yet for that guy, so that's negative one, zero, one. So you can see how, depending on how you set up D and depending on how many repeated eigenvalues you have, um, you can have different P's. But what do we know? If I, if I do the inverse of that matrix and I multiply times that A on the left, and then I take this matrix and multiply times that on the right, or do that in any order as long as I do it um, on the right and on the left, what will I end up with? This diagonal matrix. And that is very, very useful. And with that, I will leave you until I see you tomorrow, Monday, for our last Monday.